Welcome again to our study of the Gospel according to Luke. Today we will be reading Luke chapter 8. It will deal with some women who were disciples of Jesus. It will talk about parables and their purpose. And then there are several miracles at the end of the chapter that we'll want to examine briefly. But let's go to the first few verses of the chapter. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. Well, Jesus traveled through the towns and villages of Galilee, and he was preaching the gospel, and others went with him. He had chosen twelve who were to be his apostles, and they certainly were with him. And there were some women also who went along. The parables were filled with positive examples of women who were disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught lessons about women in those parables. There was a woman leavening meal that he talked about in Matthew chapter 13. A woman praying. These women, many of them, became heroes in his story, unlike what the Jews would probably have done. Jesus emphasizes goodness in these women. There was a woman and the lost coin in Luke chapter fifteen that we will discuss when we get to that chapter, and a widow who gave two mites into the treasury of the temple and was blessed in Jesus' comments concerning her. Jesus encouraged Martha to be more like Mary, for example, who sat at his feet to be instructed by him. And we'll talk about that in Luke chapter 10. So you can see a a consistent kind of message coming from Jesus in admiration and admonition to these women who were disciples. Jesus interacted with women. That confused the crowd sometimes, even confused some of his disciples. It was unheard of for a Jewish rabbi to spend that time in regard to women. Jesus stopped on his way from the south to Galilee to talk to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. He spoke to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. He will bless the widow at Nain in healing her son who had died. He will be blessing a woman with a bleeding disorder in our chapter today in Luke chapter 8. And he recognizes the great faith of a Gentile woman in Matthew chapter 15. These women that are mentioned in the first part of Luke chapter 8 
are named. The women identified here provided for Jesus from their possessions. These women followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him and to the disciples whom they apparently knew and who they wanted to help. At the same time, it was necessary for certain things to be done as Jesus went and taught his disciples who would follow him in the teaching. They would need special food, for example. They would need caring. They would need some of those things that we generally associate with the care and the provision of traveling and just daily living. And so these women of faith, women who believed in the Lord and wanted to serve him, found their way to do that, sometimes from their own possessions. Mary Magdalene is mentioned. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, is mentioned. Susanna. And then the text says there were many others. Some of these same women appear at the cross of Christ as he is being crucified. Certainly his mother, Mary. Mary's sister, probably, the mother of Zebedee's children, Salome. Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Mary Magdalene. Salome, if all previous assumptions are true, is the woman who made the ambitious request of Jesus that her sons be prominent in the kingdom, James and John. That's seen in Matthew chapter 20. If she is Mary's sister, then James and John were Jesus' cousins. That's an interesting conjecture to make at this point. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was apparently the mother of James the Less and Joseph. She was the wife of Clopas, who was otherwise called Alphaeus, at least that is what we suspect. She would be the second Mary who followed Jesus and was the mother of an apostle. Perhaps she was healed by Jesus as well. She is at the cross and she is at the burial of Jesus in Mark chapter 15. Apparently she was a generous, brave, loving, faithful, woman. There was with this company also a Mary who is called Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. Magdalene was not her last name as we would think of it. It means that she was from a town or a region called Magdala, which was a community to the west and around the north part of the Sea of Galilee. Mary Magdalene is thought to have been a fallen woman. Notice in Luke 8 at verse 2, the text says certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. The idea that these women who had been healed of demonic possession were fallen women who had become penitent is conjecture. Some have thought they were saved from the life of the street sins. That wrongly presumes 
that the seven demons represented personal evil in the women and immorality on their part. Jesus saw demon possession as being victimized by evil spiritual forces. He did not see it as being an active accomplice of the demon. He did not see the women as being evil. This leads us to believe that they were healed women rather than social derelicts. The Roman church for many years was mistaken about Mary Magdalene. There is no evidence that she was immoral or had been. The first notion of Mary as immoral comes from a sermon delivered by Pope Gregory in A.D. 591. While the Catholic Church did not officially correct this teaching until 1969, Gregory's sermon did not really trash Mary. Instead, he held her up as a tribute to the grace of God that transforms lives. Mary Magdalene is presently held in high regard by the Catholic Church. And again, there is no evidence that she was a wicked, immoral woman. Some have contended that Mary Magdalene was a hysterical woman. She was the first witness named at the tomb of Jesus, and she is identified with other women. Renan and others have claimed that she was hysterical in thinking that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. They try to discredit her testimony to the resurrection. Mary had been cured of her malady with the demons long before that, however, and she was a witness by that to Jesus' power over Satan. So such a cure would not leave her hysterical. It would leave her as an honest, sincere, and competent witness to the resurrection of Christ. Back to these women, they were women of great commitment. Again, in Matthew chapter 27, at the death of Jesus, many women were there, watching from a distance, Matthew says. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. In John chapter 20, we are told early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So they were there, both at the crucifixion of Christ and then to witness his resurrection in John 20. Mary Magdalene was the first person Jesus appeared to after the resurrection. That's testified to by both John and Mark. So these women were women of commitment to Christ. That would suggest that they had great faith in the Lord. They were also people of communication. Mary not only demonstrated a deep commitment to Jesus, but she communicated his message as she was sent to go to the other disciples and to share the good news of the resurrection. In John 20, at verse 18, the text says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, 
that he had said these things to her. Well, there is a very good relationship between Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, and these women who helped them in their preaching of the gospel. Women today can have a very important role in helping to spread the gospel and in the support of preachers and teachers of God's word, elders and deacons, as we seek to do God's will and spread the message of the gospel. Well, let's go back now to the text in Luke chapter 8. At verse 4 we are told, When a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. He said, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Now think about the ground on which the seed is falling. That's going to be our primary focus. Some fell, verse 6, on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. It would also lack roots. Verse 7, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But, verse 8, others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear we'll see the interpretation of this parable because Jesus will completely show it to these disciples, revealing what he certainly had in mind. But let's remember now there are four types of soil. The wayside, the rock, the thorny, and the good ground. Well, his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Jesus is going to explain to them why he's teaching in parables. He's going to show the purpose for the parables. The word parable comes from a Greek word, para bole. Para, the first part of the word, means alongside of, and it is used as a preposition in the Greek language. Balo means to throw. It's a verb. The idea of the word is throwing down a natural occurrence, usually a recognizable but fictitious event from daily life alongside a spiritual truth to reinforce Jesus' teaching. Some have said it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Thus it is a comparison of some divine lesson to a normal situation for the purpose of teaching. The situation may not 
be an actual situation, but it could be a normal type situation that would occur regularly in the lives of the people. There are 40 identifiable parables in the Gospels, 40 of them. Now, the purpose of parables was several fold. One, the parable was intended to reveal truth, and Jesus' parables, when studied carefully, reveal something of the gospel that he brought to mankind. Sometimes the parables were intended to conceal the truth, to keep it from someone else, Jesus would tell a story. To those who are not ready for it, for the truth, or who would not receive the truth, the parable might conceal the truth and make it so they didn't get it. The parable also had the effect of preserving the truth. They would remember the story of the parable, and that would help them to remember and to keep the truth in mind. And sometimes the parable was to elicit the truth from those reluctant to receive it to call it forth from them as a parent because when compared to the story he told, the truth became evident. So the parables made the truth understandable in language that people could easily comprehend. It arrested their attention. Stories always do in sermons. It held their interest. It facilitated the learning process by means of a story. It drove home a special point of truth that they would need to see. It made the point difficult to deny because the story was so obvious. It left the critic without defense either portray a type of human character to imitate or to avoid. And the parable would reveal a principle of God's character or his government of mankind dealings with the world and man. How should we interpret parables? That's a question that arises sometimes. Generally, we need to understand there was one main point to a parable, something that Jesus was particularly getting at in a particular uh, parable. We should not try to make every detail in a parable have some great meaning. Often minor points are just part of the story, not part of the lesson. They are drapery, we might say, surrounding the lesson. Then we need to understand that if Jesus gives a meaning to any part of the parable, that meaning should be respected. In no case should the story, the parable, be the primary source for a doctrine unless Jesus identifies it to be so. In no case, however, should a parable be interpreted to contradict any plain teaching of Scripture. I wish we had time to go into illustrations of each of these guidelines to interpreting parables. One may interpret parables by Jesus' own interpretation, 
If he says this is what it means, then we must accept that. We may interpret parables by a study of the context in which they are found. We may interpret parables by a study of the circumstances that are surrounding the story that Jesus is dealing with at the time. We may interpret parables by the persons to whom it is addressed and by what Jesus says about their character. We may interpret parables by the revealed effect of the teaching of the parable or by the parable accounts in the other gospel narratives. And we may need to look at customs that are alluded to in the parable so we don't make a mistake and go in the wrong direction. Interpreting parables is a good lesson in hermeneutics, in understanding New Testament authority, in recognizing the rules of Jesus' life. So I hope that's helpful as we go on into the book of Luke, because from this point we will see a number of others among those 40 parables that Jesus told in the gospel narratives. Back to our text now, Jesus is going to give a specific explanation of the parable that he had already told concerning these four types of soil on which seed would fall. So he says in verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside, that's one type of soil, are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The wayside would be hard ground on which seed would fall and the devil comes, like birds might come, and take away the seed. Remember, the seed, spiritually, is the word of God. Verse 13, then he says, But the ones on the rock are those who, when they have received, receive the word of God. These have no root, who believe for a while, and in the time of temptation fall away. The ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fr fruit to maturity. The world, with its cares, with its materialism, with its pleasures, keeps many hearts from having the word of God take deep root and continue. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. This last verse emphasizes to the people what he's really talking about. He's really talking about our hearts being receptive to hear the word with a noble and good intention. People who keep the word and then bear fruit with patience. So Jesus' parable has application to every one of those who initially heard it and to all of us who are reading it today. Following his explanation of that parable, 
Jesus gives the disciples some true sayings, three of them, in the next three verses. In verse 16, Jesus said, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel, or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand, that those who enter may see the light. Once one lights a lamp, he intends for that light to shine and influence the environment. He doesn't then cover it up or hide the light. Now Jesus is the light, and we are to be the light of the world, he says, so we should not be hidden. He goes on in verse 17 to say, Next, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light, either for good or for bad. The light reveals. God reveals. Christ as the light of the world reveals. God's revelation enlightens concerning all spiritual truth. So in verse 18 he says, Take heed how you hear. That goes back, does it not, to the parable that he told. Take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. The one who listens to God with care will have much. He who does not listen to God's word will be destitute spiritually and will lose his soul. Well, verse 19 then moves on and tells us, Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. Apparently these people thought he should drop everything and go. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Another reference to the importance of hearing God's word and following it in our lives. Now there's no indication in this story as to why Mary and his brothers had come to see Jesus. In fact, apparently, there was a sister. Mark adds, and my sister, Mark 3, verse 35, was with them. Jesus had siblings. He had brothers and at least one sister. That provides us further evidence denying the Catholic doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary. But the story, as we have it told here by Luke, is intended to stress Jesus' spiritual emphasis in his teaching, stresses his spiritual relationship with believers, how important that was to Jesus, and he wants his disciples to know that that's more important than any earthly, material, or physical relationship that he might have. He had come into the world to save sinners, and he was doing that with his teaching. Well, in verse 22, we are told about a storm on the lake when Jesus was there with his disciples. 
It happened, the text says, on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, the boat was, and they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, the disciples, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. This is the first of four miracles in the remaining part of Luke chapter 8. And notice it shows his power over the natural elements, the sea, the wind. That seems to be the point of this particular miracle. Well, when these activities had been concluded, they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. That is, the land of the Gadarenes was to the east of the Sea of Galilee whereas Galilee proper, the region itself, was to the west. Well, when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Well, Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. Remember our recognition of the fact that a legion in the Roman army was a lot of soldiers. He had many demons, so he was called Legion. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. That is, the demons begged Jesus that. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, the swine. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. The abyss, that is, the deep, probably refers here to the realm of the dead evil spirits where they would be imprisoned forever away from this world. They begged Jesus not to send them there. Well, in verse 35, the people went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. He had not been before, remember. And they were afraid. They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. 
and then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Swine, you remember, were forbidden among Jews. These owners were apparently in violation of Jewish custom and perhaps even Jewish law. One, this is one of only a few actions of Jesus that are considered to be less than benevolent. Remember, he caused a tree to be withered, and he overthrew the money changers. So there were events that were not benevolent in their motive in the life of Jesus, not that they were wrong or sinful, they certainly were not. And on this occasion, remember, the demons asked to go into the hogs, into the swine. And Jesus relented by allowing them to do so. Well, the man from whom the demons had departed, verse 38, begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. He obeyed the Lord on this occasion, didn't he? So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Obviously, Jesus knew that it was not best for Legion to go with him. It was better for him to go and show himself so others would see God's work and see God's power. Well, verse 41 then goes on to the next of these miracles, the third. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. A ruler of a synagogue oversaw the worship and took care of the property, the physical property. He assigned those who were to have part in the worship of the synagogue. So he had an important role, and several of these rulers of synagogues are mentioned in both Luke and Acts. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now that story about Jairus and his dying daughter is interrupted as Jesus proceeds to his house. It is interrupted by a woman who has been hemorrhaging for a long period of time and is asking to be healed by the Lord. Verse 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for twelve years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him 
she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. That reason must have been her faith. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I think it's well for us to spend just a moment thinking about the consequences of this woman's condition, hemorrhaging for a period of 12 years. There is material involvement, physical involvement for her over this long period of time. The physical impact on her health resulting from continual bleeding over a 12-year period had to be significant. The emotional impact of that was also affecting her mental health, as you see from some of the stress that she has evidence in her life. And then the economic impact is alluded to in the story when it tells us that all her finances had been spent in seeking a cure from the physicians of that day. Physical, emotional, and economic impact upon this woman's well-being had to be a reason for her coming to Jesus with such urgency. But also there was spiritual involvement that we must not overlook. Spiritual impact would make her ceremonially unclean, and that would limit her ability to worship, to worship during the daily periods, the weekly periods, the monthly periods, and the annual feasts. She would be limited in what she could do in expressing her worship to God. And then there was the social impact that came through that spiritual involvement. She would not be allowed to touch family or friends because she would make them unclean. So this woman's health, her mental health, and her spiritual health were all impacted by what her condition would force upon her. She really needed God's blessing. She needed for Jesus to heal her. He saw that. He took compassion on her and he healed her and told her to go away because her faith had made her whole. That would indicate a spiritual blessing as well as a physical blessing to this lady. Well, back to the story of Jairus and his appeal to Jesus. While Jesus was still speaking, that is, to this woman who had interrupted his travel to Jairus' house, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. That sounds abrupt, but he was given the fact. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Peter, James, and John were allowed to witness several things that we will see as we proceed through the book of Luke that the other disciples were not privy to, at least in immediate circumstance. Well, all were weeping, all wept, and mourned for the girl. 
But Jesus said, Do not weep, she is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. And then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Was she dead or was she sleeping? Well, to Jesus she was just sleeping. Was she really dead? Yes, she was, in the literal sense. And we know that because the text clearly says in verse 55 that her spirit returned. Separation of the spirit from the body is what death is, by definition. Jesus says that she is as if she were just sleeping and she would arise. It was temporary. Death is permanent. There is a difference. And Jesus knew that. Jesus raised three persons other than himself. And I think there is something subtle in understanding these three stories that we might ought to just mention and let you think about. He, he raises Jairus' daughter here in Luke chapter 8. This girl is still on her bed in her room. Her spirit has just left within a very short period of time. Jesus raises her from the dead. Was she dead? Yes. Was she fully dead? Yes, you're not partly dead. You are either alive or your spirit has left. The text says her spirit returned to her. He raised the widow of Nain's son. We saw that earlier in Luke chapter 7. This boy had been dead long enough to be carried out on a bier, on a casket, an open casket, to the cemetery at Nain. Unlike the girl, his body would have shown some of the rigors of death. And then Jesus raises Lazarus in John chapter 11. Lazarus had been dead for four days. It is true, as they said, that his body would show the decaying signs of death. Even the odors of death would have been upon him. The girl, her spirit had just left. Her cheeks may have still been pink her body still warm. The widow of Nain's son, dead long enough to be carried out to his grave. His body would have shown much more the signs of death. And Lazarus, the text is explicit to say, he stinketh. So, Jesus himself was raised on the third day, Luke chapter 24, came forth from the grave showing his power as God the Son, proving by his resurrection who he is. He showed who he is by healing these other three, each at a different stage of decay following death. Well, the girl's parents were astonished. He charged them to tell no one what had happened. Probably 
it was obvious that all those people that were at their house would have known and would have spread that word. Well, that brings us to the end of chapter 8. I hope that you have been benefited by reading through this chapter and by hearing a few comments about some of the things related to Jesus' mission and his purpose and his activities. I hope that you'll have a blessed day and that you'll be back for our study of Luke chapter 9.